So um, uh, I ho have a lot of strong opinions. A bunch of them are wrong. So uh, you know, take what you hear is with a grain of salt. Um, I used to run um, something called a product design consultancy. I don't know if you guys have heard that term before, but usually helping big companies think through like new product strategy. So these are some companies that you may have heard of. Uh, IDEO is probably the biggest and, and most well known. Um, there's a company uh, locally here in Boston called Continuum, which is that uh, bottom right one there. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of those companies, but I used to run a company just like that, essentially the same thing. Big companies come in and they say, hey, we have this really really interesting idea for this new product. We uh, we would love to have some help designing it and building it. Um, and so we would sort of think through, you know, okay, so we want to come up with some sketches and con sort of conceptualize what the product will look like. This is a really exciting example of a shopping cart. Um, going through thinking what that would look like, how that would be used, how much it would cost, how to build prototypes, and then eventually how to actually manufacture that scale. So I've worked on about uh, you know 25 or 30 different products, that some of which you may own. Um, and I'm, I thought I'd give a little bit of background on some of the stuff that I've done specifically so you can think I'm less crazy than I may appear. Or more, I don't know. Um, uh, this is a project we did with uh, Ferrari. Uh, and so this was uh, Ferrari saying, you know, you, we own these uh, $250,000 cars that you drive like three days a year. Um, so you want to show off to the rest of the world that you own one of these things. The general theory here was you would tick a, uh, a, a checkbox at the bottom of the order form, and you would get one of these $20,000 stereo speakers that you would put in your home or office that would be painted in the exact same paint as your car when it was made. Um, a little silly, I know, but it's a really fun project as a designer. Um, so this thing wa uh, weighs about 600 pounds, big, huge piece of aluminum um, designed to sort of fit into the Ferrari aesthetic, carbon fiber, and all kinds of fancy machining features and stuff. Um, you guys may, um, may know iHome. I don't know if you've heard that name before. It's like a little thing where you plug a, uh, an iPhone into and you place music out of it. It's like one of the first big like connected accessories for the home. Um, this is the, a major competitor in Europe. This was like the, basically the European equivalent of the iHome. Um, uh, snowshoeing. I'd never been snowshoeing before until this client came to us and was like, hey, we want to redesign the snowshoe, um, which is interesting. Um, but it's really a design problem, right? You're trying to learn how do people use snowshoes, how do you, you know, get into them and walk around with them, and how do you design a better, lighter one. This is a company called Atlas Snowshoe that we did a bunch of work with. Um, this is fun. This is uh, really weird. This is a, a piece of furniture that we built. This is a chair. We only made five of these, so this is a little bit different than a lot of the other stuff. But so the, the idea here was like people have uh, like a couch that just like sits statically in your house, um, and you want to be able to move things around and change the shape and stuff. So this thing is like a is like a Lego kit. You get like a box of couch cushions, and you can like connect them in like different orientations and stuff. I, again, I would never buy one of these, but it's fun to work on. Um, this is, uh, this is the first Bluetooth iPhone accessory ever shipped. Um, so this is a universal remote control for your phone. So you would like buy, you know, take your iPhone, you'd walk into your room, you have this little like hockey puck looking thing that would sit on your like you know, coffee table, and your interface for your TV, DVD player, VCR would actually show up on your, on your phone. So you wouldn't have to like find like 15 different remotes and your couch cushions and stuff. Um, so uh, the problem with this is that you're not aligned with your customers, right? So when you're in this consultative arrangement, when you have uh, you know, someone who's paying you $500,000 a year or whatever to help you build products, you're diametrically opposed to helping build better stuff, right? So this is what happen all the time. Companies would say, here, we're going to give you, you know, half a million bucks, build this really interesting you know, prototype of this product, and we would deliver something that was like, you know, pretty good, but not maybe not perfect, because creativity is hard to predict. And they'd say, oh, well, how about you spend another, you know, six months redesigning it? And we'd say, okay, well, how about you pay us another $500,000? Um, and that's not very aligned, right? So, um, so, so I've always been trying to find, for the last couple of years, a better way to work with companies that are trying to build hardware where they're not monetizing you for hours. They're monetizing based on something else. And so I'll get back to how uh, we wound up at Bolt. Um, but something really weird happened uh, in the last couple of years. It used to be that hardware was this really like awkward thing. Um, and if you were building a piece of hardware and trying to build a company around it, uh, you know, if, it, if it wasn't a Facebook app or something, people would tell you to go away. Um, but hardware has become really popular uh, all of a sudden. It's sort of weird. Um, it's great for guys like me, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting world. Um, it's really confusing to a lot of people because it used to be the exact opposite. They'd say, oh, I want to build a robot, and they'd be like, you know, Get the hell out of here. I don't want to give you any money. Um, so, you know, kind of, I, I, I always find it fun to talk about why, because uh, this is a pretty interesting change. This is like a major tectonic shift in like the startup culture. And there's a bunch of things that you guys are probably familiar with all this stuff. So, um, you know, I apologize if this is boring. Um, but I, I find this stuff pretty fascinating. So, um, 
So the smartphones, we don't give these guys enough credit for like changing the landscape of hardware. Um, you know, a lot of people think of like, oh, and I have like Wi-Fi and cell in my pocket, and that's cool. Uh, that's really obvious. It, that has a major impact on componentry costs, right? So there are all these processors and screens and all these other things that are being made in quantities of literally billions per year that we now can get components at startups for really cheap because they're just lying around all over the place. That makes a huge difference to the, the, the barriers to entry into building a hardware company. Um, uh, this is, you know, it used to be that, you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted to, you know, I don't know, you were Apple, you wanted to build, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, a new product somewhere, you had to build a factory, right? You had to go out and, like, buy, you know, spend tens of millions of dollars in equipment and hire, you know, build an assembly line and, you know, have a bunch of workers and all this stuff, and it was really hard to do. And now you just hire someone in China. It's way easier to do. So they have all the capital costs, and they actually help you manufacture that stuff. It's still pretty hard to do, um, but it's much easier than it, than it, than it used to be. Um, 3D printers have become really popular now. I actually, I'm like a little bit negative on 3D printers. I think they're really useful, um, but they help make the prototyping process faster. Um, also, uh, these guys, this is a really bad, I'm not an electrical engineer, but I pretend to be one sometimes. And um, this, uh, this is a, my poor example of a system on a chip. So this is like this crazy thing that's happened with having, you know, when you have a Bluetooth radio now, you don't have to go out and like buy all these different components and put them together. You can buy one module that has all the stuff that you need to actually begin developing prototypes for it. Um, and then things like Kickstarter, um, our friends at Dragon have, a, have another crowdfunding platform that has allowed you um, to do sort of the market business side in certain aspects for certain kinds of products much faster than you could before. So all these things sort of help contribute to make it really easy. Um, it's actually still really fucking hard. Um, and this is something that not enough people appreciate. They're like, oh, I can just go, you know, make a little prototype in my basement and put it on Kickstarter and I'm done. It's great. I'll make a million dollars. And it doesn't actually work that way. Um, so I'm going to talk about why. So the first thing is, uh, are, are these guys. This is the most important thing uh, anybody can ever tell you, which is that the people that you work with in the company that you're trying to start are the most important thing that you will ever do. Um, so that selection, it's like as important as getting married. It maybe in some ways it's more important than getting married. Um, I'm, as a single guy, I can say that. Um, but so, you know, these are, this is like arguably the best baseball team in the history of all time. Sorry, I'm from New York. Um, don't shoot me, please, if you're from Boston. Um, but this is mostly true, uh, and <laughs> and um, and this is really important, right? You want to be with the Babe Ruths and you know I don't know all the other guys that are really good. I don't really follow baseball. Um, you got to build prototypes, right? When you're building a prototype of a software application, it's actually relatively quick to do, um, and with hardware, it's much more difficult. So this is does anybody know what this is? This is a first prototype of something that you might hear less. That's right. So this is a really early prototype. I don't know if this is supposed to be public, so don't tell anybody I showed you this. Um, market is huge. This is something a lot of young entrepreneurs don't think about. They don't realize that you know, actually getting uh, a real problem, a solution for a real problem is, is critical to the way they operate. So you want to find something that is going to attract a lot of people, solving a real need for a bunch of people, or a small number of people that are willing to pay a lot of money for that solution. So you're going to spend, you know, 10 years of your life working um, really hard at some problem, and you want to make sure it's a really significant problem. This is one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of entrepreneurs make. They're, they spend their entire lives raising money and you know, you know, losing their relationships with their people and like living in cages, and they're working on these little tiny problems. Um, so we encourage people to work with awesome big problems. Um, this is an injection mold tool, or this is one half of an injection mold tool. I don't know if any of you guys have ever done like manufacturing at scale. Um, these kind of suck. This is a really expensive thing that you have to get really right. This is how most of the plastic things in your life are made. Um, these can cost you know fifty thousand, hundred thousand, million dollars, depending on you know all kinds of variables. And these are really hard to do. You can't like unlike in software where you can like Google you know you know how do I write this Ruby on Rails code. You can't Google, like, how do I make an injection mold tool? So this is, like, really hard to do. Um, you got to find these, like, old burly guys that are, like, you know, went to the Vietnam War and know how to, like, you know, make, make tools really well. Um, and so this is, this is really tricky to manufacture stuff well. Um, a lot of people don't know, like, things still move on boats. Most of the stuff that you have actually is shipped across the ocean, not on a plane, but on the boat. This is a huge boat. I don't know if you've ever seen any of these in real life. They're, like, way bigger than you think. Um, each one of these little boxes is the back of an 18-wheeler. Like, you see these things driving down the street. Um, it's, so it's gigantic. And this takes four to six weeks to get, get from Hong Kong uh, to Long Beach, where most of the, the cargo comes into the United States. Um, it's a long time, right? When you're making a change to a piece of software, uh, that usually goes out in some minutes. Um, this takes, you know, four to six weeks. And that's just to get from, 
you know, one port to the other. Then you've got to put it on a truck and move it around, and there's all kinds of complexity. It's just moving atoms around. It's really hard. Um, this is something that people don't think about. You have to have inventory, right? So when Target says, hey, I really want to buy, you know, half a million units of your product, they say, I'm only going to pay for like 50,000 right now, but you've got to have another 450,000 in a warehouse somewhere, so when I'm ready to buy them, you know, they're right there. So you have to pay for all this stuff, right? So this could be, you know, $50 million worth of product that you just have sitting in a warehouse somewhere. So this is another thing you have to think about. These guys are the worst. Uh, not Best Buy, necessarily. If you're from Best Buy, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, these, are, these guys are really hard to work with, right? So they take a big margin. So if, let's say you're selling, a, a, you know, a product costs you, you know, $10 to make, and you're selling it for $50. Best Buy is usually going to take, like, $20 of that just to sell it. Right, it's really expensive. Um, you have to deal with sell-in and understanding how to present this thing and advertising and all these elements that are coming around to, to get to communicate with customers. You cannot build a real business by selling directly online. It's really hard. Uh, so you have to really think through retail strategy. And everybody's favorite, you need lots of money. Um, all these, every single thing I just listed costs money. Uh, again, with software, you don't have any of those costs. So you know, your Amazon Web Service instance doesn't cost anything compared to how much it costs to build injection mold tools. So you have to think through all these issues. This is a phrase that's like become trite now, but you know, they call it hardware for a reason. It's really freaking hard. Um, and, and so uh, over the last, uh, I, I don't know, I'd say sort of like two years, there's been this sort of movement to help a lot of companies work on some of these things. Um, you guys may be familiar with some accelerator programs. These are like the two biggest that most people know, Y Combinator uh, on the West Coast and Techstars, which has this sort of like franchise model where they have these things all over the country. There's one here in Boston. They started in Boulder. They have one in Seattle and New York, and they're all over the place. Um, and so the way these guys work is they say, hey, we really want to help startup companies. Why don't you, you know, fill out a little application, and we'll accept some very tiny percentage of you and give you a bunch of help. Uh, and usually they leverage mentors, these sort of like interesting folks that typically are doing angel investments that have a lot of experience on the business side of whatever it is that you're working on. And they'll help you actually like think through all the problems that you know, are sort of circling around your business. Uh, and, and these guys are great. There are some great companies that have helped start it, you know, Dropbox, Airbnb. Um, there's a bunch of companies here in Boston that have gone through Techstars that are great. Um, the, one of the downsides of these guys is that they're really focused on software companies. And so the vast, vast majority of the companies that these guys work with are web service, you know, Facebook apps, iPhone apps, whatever. Um, and, and so that's really useful for a lot of companies that, that are a lot of new hardware companies because they actually do have sort of apps and electronics and other things that are sort of relevant to the software world. But they miss out on all that stuff I was just talking about, like the shipping and the logistics and bill materials and engineering and tooling and all this other stuff. Um, so because of that, like everything, there's been a bunch of other companies that have come along that are sort of like a little bit more aware of that stuff. So. Um, you know, the, this company called Hackcelerator, it was really the first one they started in Shenzhen, China, where a lot of stuff is manufactured. And they uh, sort of have a lot of relationships with factories that can kind of help you think through some of that stuff. Um, and there's a whole bunch of others that have cropped up, really all based on this Techstars model of, like, mentorship. Um, I uh, actually don't really find that model particularly useful for the way in which I interoperate with companies. And so I started um, this company, Bolt, um, uh, that looks like this, uh, that is designed from the ground up the way I build products. And so we think of it as sort of this weird combination um, of three things that don't usually go together, but I'm weird, so I put them together. Um, the first is a uh, product design firm, right? So I was just talking about Brainstream and IDEO and all these companies that really help creatively think through the actual development process of a product. And so we sort of think of like a third of what Bolt does as like actually a sort of, sort of uh, you know, product design arm inside of the way we operate. Um, the next piece, and probably the, the, peop the, the piece that people are most interested from the outside, is, is venture capital. So we actually invest money into companies. Um, and these are only hardware companies. And this, the reason for doing this is that hardware takes a lot of money. And so you have to understand really how to think through the, the process of going through the manufacturing and supply chain and, and all of those things. Um, and then the third is the, actually the manufacturing piece. So one of our partners is a company called Dragon Innovation. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of them before, but they work with companies like MakerBot and Zio and Vitality and Pebble, the, the neat uh, watch thing that on Kickstarter. Um, they actually go to China and actually help them manufacture these products. They have about 20 people in China that are on the ground, you know, speak Cantonese and Mandarin, and all the factories will actually help you think through this. So part of our deals, when we write a, just a regular investment check into a company, we actually help support them with manufacturing too. Um, so we're trying to provide as much as we can sort of in-house. Um, 
More specifically, I'll talk a little bit about five things, and then we can talk more about generally venture capital in a second. I don't want to focus too much on, on, on the Bolt stuff. Um, so the first is um, this strapping uh, group of white men, um, uh, which uh, I didn't design it that way. It just kind of happened. Um, which is here is is here for the companies, right? So when we uh, write 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 a check, we're um, you know sitting on the ground with you. We've shipped tens of millions of units of product. We know how to build this stuff, and we are just here for you. So we have a team of engineers, you know, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, industrial design uh, designers, a firmware guy, uh, a guy that builds prototypes all day in the shop, uh, and can actually help you do all this stuff. Uh, you don't have to pay for that. It's just a part of the service that we provide. Um, and we've we've done some pretty cool stuff, uh, if I'd say so myself. Uh, uh, Roomba, if you guys know the little vacuum cleaner, this is the only robot thing that I really have ever worked on, so um, that's there. Uh, Pebble Watch, uh, you guys have seen that. This is the Unity thing that I showed you before. Um, and then one of my other partners is a venture capitalist and has started these companies, SolidWorks, E-Ink, VideoIQ, GrabCAD, if you, if you guys know them. Um, so all sort of like hardware-ish companies. Um, this is our shop that's uh, not too far from here in downtown Crossing. We have about a million dollars of equipment that the companies, uh, again, all use for free. We maintain, uh, we own, we fix, we supply materials for. You just have, you just get to use them. Um, so CNC equipment, uh, electronics, uh, this is all like rapid prototyping, so laser cutter and uh, 3D printers and stuff. Um, we give you money, which is really nice. Uh, we have relationships with a bunch of vendors, so like ProtoMold gives free injection mold tooling to every company that goes through our program. Uh, Arrow gives lines of credit for components that you couldn't get as a startup, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and then we help with manufacturing. So this is actually a picture I took. Uh, we took three of our companies that are doing consumer products to China. This is, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to China before, uh, or in, in a factory in China, which is particularly interesting. Um, this is an awesome factory in Dongguan called Early Light that makes pretty much every Mattel and Hasbro toy you've ever worked with, or played with, I guess. Hopefully you don't work with them. <laughs> that would be weird. Um, and uh, th uh, these, this, remember I talked about these injection mold tools, so these are all like cavities here. And this goes probably 300 yards down. Like, it looks way farther down when you're in real life. And these are just guys that are sitting behind bridge ports, which are these old milling machines, and just fixing tools all day. Um, pretty, pretty amazing. But one of the really special things about working with someone like Dragon uh, and the guys that have done a lot of this is this guy right here is actually the owner of the factory. So, which you don't get access to when you're just a startup making 5,000 units. So it's pretty cool that the owner of the factory, and this has 60,000 employees, um, just walks around with you and shows you stuff. So it's a really valuable sort of exposure. Um, and then we help with all the business stuff too. So the most important that we'll talk a little bit more about here is, is raising private capital, um, which really comes from two sources. One is called angel investors, and these are like really early stage, usually individual guys that are investing their own money. Um, and then the other is venture capital, which you're probably more familiar with, which are you know guys that are investing other people's money. Um, so uh, the first question that, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but the first question that every company should ask themselves is, do you actually want to raise VC? Um, there are very few companies that actually fit into the category of yes here. It's so sexy and cool and everyone's like, yeah, I really want to raise venture capital, it's going to be awesome. But a lot of the times it's actually um, not the right thing to do. So the analogy I use is that venture capital is like jet fuel. Right? So it's designed to like make planes go super fast and it's awesome. It's like a you know, rocket ship. But if you put you know, rocket fuel into a Honda Civic, it blows up. So, you know, you have to make sure you're the right kind of car if you want to do this. You can totally be a Honda Civic. Honda Civics are awesome. They, you sell way more Honda Civics than rocket ships. Um, but it's just a different sort of dynamic of how you want to think about this stuff. So uh, I, I try to recommend companies really think through that. And I'm more than happy. I didn't exactly know what the audience was, so I didn't, like, go into formally, like, thinking about what you'd want to talk about. But I'm more than happy to talk about what, what makes sense for VC and what doesn't. Um, if you're interested in raising VC, these are some of the guys that are the most open to hardware companies, especially robotics companies. So um, uh, these guys are, are great. Um, some of these guys are here in Boston, uh, some are on the West Coast, some are in Boulder. Um, you'll find that there are four things that really matter to every VC, and really every investor, um, but VCs in very particular. Um, and the first, I'm going to say this again. I like to show this slide, as you can tell. Um, having this team is so important. If someone is going to write you a check for a couple million bucks or many millions of dollars, it's really hard to tell what, if what you're doing today is going to be the same thing that you're doing 10 years from now. And so they have to trust that the people that they're giving that money to is going to be able to actually carry the company you know, across the goal line. The chances are very high that what you start off doing is not what you wind up doing. And so they have to ensure that the, the people behind the company are actually making the right decisions in order to get there. Um, again, this goes back to the market thing. You want to be working on something really big. 
Uh, and so and th this has to do with the dynamics of the way venture capital works. And again, I'm more than happy to like explain that whole world. But they have, you know, VCs have actually their own investors. They're called LPs. They're guys with huge amounts of money. And they write, you know, $50 million, $100 million checks into these venture firms. And they have to make a big return on those investments. But, you know, building um, a, a VC portfolio is a lot like building, it's like a movie studio, right, where you have, you produce 10 movies and nine of them suck. But one of them is so good that it pays for all the other failures and then some, right? Which is why people make $200 million movies. Um, so VCs actually think the same way. They're like, we're going to invest in all these crazy risky things. One of them is going to hit and it's going to pay back for all the other ones. And so if you're not a potential to be in that you know, huge category, then you should go home and you should talk to other investors or no investors at all, um, which is okay. Uh, investors love to see traction. So they want to see that what you're talking about is actually going to be useful and you can demonstrate some sort of ability to impress your customers or you know have revenue or something that shows that people find what you're doing real. Um, this is my favorite picture of Elon Musk, our friend. Um, uh, you really got to be able to do something crazy. I don't know if you guys know much about Elon Musk. This guy is insane. He picks like the hardest possible things to do. So he is currently the CEO of three companies. One is Tesla. Building a car company is not easy. The other is SpaceX, literally building rockets. And the third is Solar City, um, or he's, I don't know if he's a CEO, but I think he's like a CTO or something, um, where they're selling you know, basically solar panels to a bunch of people, which is also really difficult. So he picks really hard problems. He did PayPal, which is like a bank. Who ever would want to start a bank? Um, so he just goes after these, these, these crazy problems. Um, I didn't really prepare too much other stuff on VC, but if you guys have questions, I would love to attempt to answer. Answer them. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. You mean you mean for but for hardware, open source for hardware? Yes. I don't know if if everybody could hear that question, but it was really about the op the viability of open source hardware. So open source software has become a hugely important thing to the technology world. Um, there's only actually really been one company uh, in the history of open source software that's actually made real money. Anybody know what that is? Red Hat. That's right. Um, every other company that tries to monetize open source, usually either they make a little money or they fail. Um, so in terms of hardware, I think it's pretty similar. There may be one or two companies that do really well, um, but it's really difficult because you have fixed costs of things that you have to distribute. Um, they're also much more likely to be copied. It's really easy to copy hardware. It's a little harder to copy software. Um, so there's some elements around there that are funny. You know, people always point to Arduino as like the success story of open source hardware. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Arduino. Um, I, if you're not, you should be. It's awesome. Um, but it's, you know, even Arduino has sold like less than a million units, right? And which is really tiny. Um, you know, you talk to Apple, they sell, I don't know, 100 million units of things every time they, 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 they make something. And that's where the money is, is in scale. So I think it's, uh, it's really difficult, to be completely honest. Uh, I hope to be proven wrong, because I think it's a great idea. But you, know, you look at companies like, you know, like, 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 like MakerBot, right, which had a whole open source thing, and then they kind of like went closed source, and everybody hates them, and now they're the big, bad, expensive company that's worth a lot of money. Um, but, but so it's just, I don't know, I, I, I think it's really difficult to do well. Yeah? <laughs> sure. Hmm. Okay, so what if you used open source components for a closed source product? It, yeah, are, is that even legal? Can, can you do that? I don't really know. Yeah. Probably people know, are there any lo lawyers in the audience? Yeah, right, yeah. But I mean, their whole thing was they were supposed to like, you know, open source their software and everything, right? Didn't they originally do that? Yeah. I don't know. I'm, the answer is I don't know. But uh, I'm guessing that's really hard legally for some reason, but I don't know why. But I guess you can have like you know open source components and a closed source application, right? You have to like attribute stuff to them, right? Hmm. I don't know how that would work. And they maybe like put your name. Yeah. 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 It's too expensive. Right. 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 Yeah, I mean, see, that's the thing is that part of the, part of the, you know, the the trick of hardware is that like every ten cents matters. So if you're selling a consumer product, there's typically a four x multiple of what you're paying for the parts. So, and that's just a totally rough guess, but you know, if you or rough estimate, but if you, um, you know, if you, so if you if you spend an extra twenty five cents on a product, that actually costs the consumer a dollar, 
And so you have to be super sensitive about how much you know your components cost. So if you're Arduino, you know you're paying a dollar, you know, licensing fee or whatever to Arduino for the name. That's just four dollars wasted right there. So you have to really be careful about how you, how you optimize that stuff.